It's Jackie Tantillo and another episode of Should Have Listened to My Mother, my weekly podcast where we talk about our relationship with our mom, good, bad, or indifferent, and are we who we are today because of or in spite of our mother. Marcy Coronado lives in Medinales, New Mexico, high arid desert area of New Mexico. Farming is very important in the area, and they constantly are struggling for enough water. Marcy was a little apprehensive about speaking with me because she's a very private person, but we're going to give her a call and see if she can share with us what I'm interested in, in cultural differences, the relationship or the role that a mother plays. So let's see, keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm sure she'll be great, so let's see what she has to say. It's always interesting to find out how the ethical and cultural differences play a role. Hello. Hi, is this Marcy Coronado? This is Marcy. Oh, hi. This is Jackie from Should Have Listened to My Mother. How are you? Good. So as I had mentioned to you initially, Should Have Listened to My Mother, my weekly podcast, is about mother-daughter, mother-son relationships, good, bad, or indifferent. And have we learned anything over the years from the lessons our mom was trying to teach us, and has it influenced our future? And what fascinates me are different cultural interpretations of what the role a mother takes, cultural and personal and ethical, moral differences of how we were all raised. Well, I think as mothers, I'm a mother, mother of three. Uh I've lost two sons. I also only have one child now, and she's an adult, but they're all children. And I think we try to keep that going that our mothers taught us, which is the love and spirituality of keeping the world going with it, right? Loving our neighbors and, you know, morality, moral scruples, of course. But I don't think there's too much difference. The cultural stuff, of course, is different. Every culture is different. Uh, Being that I am uh, part Hispanic, native, um, Spanish blood, but it's it's through Mexico, but it's still Iberian. And um, it's a little different because we were raised with all these cultures mixed here in New Mexico, in the cooking in the worshiping, in the working in the land, and stuff like that. We were raised very poorly here, very poorly. I mean, even my grandmother, she had dirt floors, outhouses, you know, an outhouse, and we were raised very, very poorly. Are you in Medinales? Yes. I've been everywhere, but I, I still ended up here, back. I've never been. But I've, I know of um, people that have been there, and they absolutely think it's heavenly. Med- so Medinales, are you north of Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and a little bit northwest of Santa Fe, maybe? If I'm... Yes, it's north of Santa Fe. You're in the hills? You're in the mountains? or? It's Sandy Hills, where I live. Well, we're at 5,800 feet. It must be beautiful. It's okay. It's a high arid desert hills. We have we have very minimal water. We have one small river going by us, which is a mile away from me. And from that, the whole community has to water their crops or their livestock if they have horses and cows, sheep, whatever they have. And is this the Asakia or this yes. Rio river. Chama? The Rio Chama River, yeah. And this is the wa- only water source for all the farming, all, everything that you have That's to it. live with. That's it. That's it. Pretty much every family farms. Is that their main source we of have substance? 40, 40 farms, 40 irrigated farms. In your family or in the whole community? The whole community. Okay, and everyone works together? More or less. 
<laughs> some yes, some no. Let's talk family. Do you have siblings? I've got seven siblings. So where are you in order? You say you're one of eight. I'm the oldest. Oh, my gosh. How wild is that? Just the opposite Pretty of Pretty wild. <laughs> it, was a tough, it was a tough upbringing. Yeah. Because I was the oldest and I was a girl. So, of course, I helped Mama with everything. You raised then your we're... younger siblings. You helped raise your younger siblings. Yes, I did. I had six brothers under me and a sister. Oh, wow. So you're t six and two, and we're six and one. Six yeah. girls, one boy in my family. Oh, wow. <laughs> What's the role of the female in the family? Did you have to do all the cooking and cleaning? Was that the role? Yes, always the cooking. Always the cooking. Uh, the boys, of course. We're an old Mexican family, raised in that culture. So the men always did the outside work. The women always did the inside work. And did you all go to school? Yes, of course. Yes. My mother insisted on that. My grandfather was a teacher. In a one-room school? Um, at the beginning, yes. But then he went to teach in Española, which is uh, 15 miles south of us. And he had, I don't know, I think it was like four rooms. Four rooms. It was four teachers. Where did your mom grow up? She grew up mostly here in Medanales. But in the winters, they would move to Española so she could go to school. Because there was no buses. There wasn't anything like that. Did you have buses? I did. We had buses. And my mother sent us to a Catholic school, of course. We had buses to the Catholic school. You can't use the excuse, I used to have to walk five miles one way in the pouring oh, rain to school. No, we didn't have rain, first of all. Oh, my we didn't gosh. Have <laughs> Hail. Did you have hail? Do you get hail? You must have some adverse Barely. weather. Barely. Weather, we had a little bit of snow, a little bit of rain in the spring, and hail in the middle of summer, which is really strange, and it would ruin a lot of crops. The last three summers, not this summer, but my mom's lost her crop of chili and stuff, you know, most of it. It's hail. It, it's, it's a phenomenon that if it's hot and it's raining, it creates an energy that really truly makes hail. Very weird, but it is. And it destroyed her whole crop. It destroyed her, yeah, her chili crop. How, your mom is still farming? Oh, God, yes. What is your mom's name? Cordelia. C-O-R-D-E-L-I-A, Cordelia. And that's what we grew up on, farming. Farming, oh, wait a minute, and weaving for Southwest Weavers. Your mom was a weaver. Uh, mm hmm My grandmother is in the Smithsonian. Tiny little, tiny village, a hobble of a place, and she has one piece in the Smithsonian. Now tell me if I mispronounce her name. Is it Agueda Martinez? Agueda. Agueda, and she is a world-renowned weaver, correct, your grandmother? Yes. And your grandfather, wasn't he the postmaster in Medellanos? Yes, the very first one. You the have very... some history here, my, my dear. Yeah, my mom, and, you know, this family has been through a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, a lot of hats. Do you want to share any of them? Well, <laughs> my grandfather was also a musician. I knew a lot of family, a lot of people, I mean. You know, he played the violin, which is a rarity, a rarity around here. But there was a lot of old-style music, a lot of folk music. And where he found the violin, I have no idea. Because, like I said, that's a rarity in this area. And from there... The uh, uncles took up music as well. One played the trumpet, and he would play with my grandfather. My mother also learned how to play the guitar, so he could play with Grandpa. Anyone pick up the music of the next generation? Oh, yes. <laughs> Everybody. Everybody. Everybody liked to play, and the women would weave. There's a couple of male weavers in the family, but they didn't really continue with it. My aunts still weave. I have a 93-year-old aunt that's still weaving. 
Wow, pretty incredible. Like my grandmother, she won't till 102. Weaving, still weaving? Yes. Does your mom still weave? Oh, yeah. She's still doing orders. Is there a way for us to see online what she does? No, no she doesn't like that at all. No, absolutely not. No, it's such a personal thing, each piece. Yeah. And the customs and stuff. There he is. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know the name of the... Oh, yeah. A fighting bear. There's a fighting bear company in Jackson, Wyoming, that she's been weaving for for many years. And... She did the tapestries for all their antique-looking couches and chairs and stuff like that that they put out of. They put out a book. These are weavings, as, as in blankets and throws. She uses a loom, or what yeah. does? Yes, yeah, she does. It's a Spanish loom, yeah, just a little. Do you weave? I stopped weaving when I had my back surgery. Oh dear. Uh, but yeah, I can still do it. <laughs> so much to do. Your daily survival, whether it's farming or weaving and cooking, and every minute is consumed with your survival in a way, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, there's no such thing as boredom. My mother hated that word, too. Oh, I'm bored. Yeah, pick up a broom, baby girl. <laughs> there's no such thing. No such thing. What was your mom like when you were growing up? I know it was tough on you because you're the oldest. She was tough. She made sure that we were not disrespecting people. She made sure that we kept up with church until we just rebelled and we stopped, you know. So we left home. And we all went our different ways when it came to spirituality. Um, She now understands that we all have our own relationship with our spiritualities. So I'm glad about that. <laughs> but she still kind of likes, okay, for my birthday, I want you all to go to church with me. Oh, God, okay. Wait, for, I'll go to church with her for her birthday? <laughs> yeah. So How do you deny here. that? <laughs> well, we just grit our teeth, you know? Right. I'll meet you out front when it's over. <laughs> So your mom controlled everything inside. You knew where the line was. Oh, yeah. Just one look or, you know. Um, she made sure things were kept in order just by saying, okay, what happened here? Nobody would tell on anybody, especially the boys. So she would line us all up, and we would all get a snack. Nobody either told on anybody. So we learned not to do anything bad. Or at least not get caught doing anything bad. Yes, exactly. So you protected one another, the kids. Of course. You know one's going to mess up. But one of my brothers messed up at school, in high school. I would be going to see the principal because mom was at work or at home with a brand-new baby. Because I was the oldest. I was driving. So the oldest were always the second in command here when it comes to and it was hard it was hard because the younger brothers especially the really younger brothers saw the oldest as me the sibling as the enforcer oh you had to play that role yeah yeah but she always made sure that things were kept in line and taken care of fix the problems now not tomorrow now you know how different then what role did your dad play my father worked outside, and he was uh, a little illiter- illiterate. He worked for the money, pay for school clothes, help buy groceries, so and so my mom couldn't grow, pay for the car, the truck that they needed for the farm. That's the role. He would take the boys out to the woods, to the bigger mountains, which is a good 25, 30 miles away, to get wood for the wood stove, because he heated with wood. Old school. Manual labor. He taught the boys labor. He was providing for his family, the most important thing to put food on the table. That's a tough existence. Yes, yeah, it was. It was tough for them. And your mom's childhood? She's one of ten children. So it was even tougher because she was one of the younger ones. And how many generations back did the family come from Mexico? Oh, no, no. My father was the only one. 
directly from. So your mom's family is from? From here, New Mexico. They say that New Mexico has 500 years of being from here because there was no transportation anywhere. There was no moving at least 500 years. So there's a lot of other smaller, really smaller towns, like uh, a good 25, 30 miles from here up north. They're really interbred. Uh, second cousins, first cousins were married, and, you know, they never went anywhere. You say, why? I mean, unless you were really forward-thinking and, and had the, right. the ability, the money. There was a lot of illiterate people up here. And you had the land, and you had family, so... And the more family you had to work the land, the better. You consider yourself indigenous to New Mexico. Oh, yes. The native people. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. My grandmother's great-great-grandmother was a Navajo slave to uh, a Spanish family up in Abiquiu. And that's the line we come from on my grandmother's side. My grandfather's side, my mom's dad, we come from the line of Chimayo, and that's where the weavers come from. And actually, that comes also from Mexico. It came in from Oaxaca. I took my mother on a vacation to Oaxaca so she can see exactly where it comes from and her designs and stuff that came in 500 years ago. It seems like you have plenty of culture and history right where you are in Medinales. And Medinales still holds your heart. I built my adobe home here. Is that what you live in now? Oh, yes. Yeah, with a bit of plaster on the outside and a good roof. That's my shelter. Could you explain briefly to my listeners the background of adobe homes? Adobe is made out of uh, clay, sand, and my house is made out of sand, clay, bricks. It's made out of thick mud. And they put it out in the sun to dry. And that's what built the original buildings other than the south-facing caves of, like, in Chaco or, you know, like, um, the other native places. Um, and it's just stacked, like brick walls. And they're usually about 10 inches wide, 13 inches long. So they're very thick and heavy. And they're glued together with the same mud. They just make some more of the same mud and just... That's just like a brick home, but this is made out of mud, dry mud. You use what there is. Learn from the old people. Work. Is there, and I know you said you, you broke away from the religious beliefs and the pressure from your mom, but yes. when you're creating like this from the earth, is there often a spiritual component involved in pretty much everything that you guys do? Like Mr. Hawkins did the God Molecule, you know? There is. A God Molecule? Yes, there is. In my heart, there definitely is. There has to be. There has to be. Have you ever spoken to your mom about what it was like when you were growing up and the pressure on you? Is she the kind of person that you could sit down and, and have these heart-to-hearts? Oh, yes. And she would say, well, why didn't you tell me that? And I said, Mom, I was too young. We weren't allowed to talk back to you because you would say, don't talk back to me. You know, to her it was disrespectful. Those regrets, right, all this time and the whether it was resentment or whatever that could can build up. And, and her simple response was, well, why didn't you say something? Right. How unfortunate is that? Which we know if we had said something, all hell would have broken loose, like you said. I would have gotten slapped in the mouth. Um, I got my mouth washed out with soap one time because I said shit. How old were you? Thirteen. I remember that day very well, of course. And I learned not to cuss in front of my mother ever again. That's another thing my mother taught us. Speak correct English or correct Spanish, but don't mess up the languages. She didn't say don't mix them up, don't mess them up. She wanted to speak correctly. There's a lot of slang slang used in all languages, of course. That was a big insult to her, I bet. Yes. Well, because it shows your either your lack of intelligence or you'll get less respect from others. And she says, the way you speak is how you 
are judged by the book. Do you believe that? Oh, yes. Oh, definitely. I've gone various places. They said, well, where did you go to college? And I said, I've never been to college. I did go to college later on, but I said, I've never been to college. Well, you don't have an accent. And I said, no. There have been a lot of, around a lot of different people, all, all walks of life, all walks of life. And what's the word? I can adjust <laughs> to wherever I am. Tells you a little bit about human nature. When needed, we can slip into whatever mode that we feel is appropriate for our surroundings. Or some people can, not everybody can, but some, or some people care not to. That's true. Not everybody can. There was a woman, um, and I will say this because it was true, a Texan woman, very beautifully coiffed, and her hair was gorgeous. Really. And it looked like a son was driving her. Beautiful vehicle. Came up to my mother's weaving studio. She did have a studio, but she used to teach weaving as well. And I would be there as her helper. I've always had my mother's right hand. I don't un- I don't know why, but I have. And I was sitting outside on the steps, going up. And she got out of the car and she says, Excuse me, Gary, do you speak English? I stood up and I said, Indubitably. <laughs> Did you have to pick her up off the ground? No. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What was the next word out of her mouth? <laughs> I don't remember. Oh, my gosh. You're very smart. But that's what your mom was trying to instill. I was just being smart ass. Yeah, but still, your mom, she, did she, she must have felt this pressure in her life to make it so much of a point to teach her children the cultural traditions and the, how important education is. She must have seen this throughout her lifetime, this prejudice and bias. Yes. Oh, she did. She saw it. She saw it. We have felt it. We went to Utah one time to a, a Western show or something. We were doing the old, old craft. So I was one of the weavers over there. And um, I had my daughter with me, and she was only like, oh, God, 10 maybe. I was in my early 30s, mid-30s. Anyways, uh, on one of our days off from this fair, I took her to an A and W to visit an ice cream. The manager there that was on, on the register wouldn't serve me because they're very much they're very much prejudiced toward the Native American. And I look like a Native American. I'm very I'm four foot eight. I'm tiny and I'm dark. Some people think I'm a very light uh, black person or African-American. He refused to serve me. He kept serving people behind me, that stood behind me. And all I was there for was an ice cream for my daughter. That's it. I didn't, I stood my ground. I didn't leave. I stood my ground in front of that cash register. He walked away as, as soon as he finished with people behind me. The young lady that stood on the next register apologized profusely. Poor thing. Poor thing. I said, no, you didn't do anything. He says, let me just give you an ice cream. And I said, well, that's what I came for. No, but I will pay for it. Please. So she gave me an ice cream. I paid for it for my daughter. She goes, I'm so, so sorry. I said, don't you worry about it. You did nothing, honey. Nothing. As we went back to the fair where we were staying at the college in Logan, Logan University, I was telling one of the guys in the evening, and he was a hey, that mandolin. He says, guess where I work, the newspaper. And I said, right on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I said, you tell this to your readers, honey bunch. And I told him the story. He says, I will. He had it in the paper the next day. We have to pass the strength on to our, all of our children, especially the daughters. Yes, exactly. Exactly. 
It happens every every second. Yes, it does. Still, which is so unfortunate. Yes, it does. See, because I've never met you, and I'm just having this wonderful conversation with you about traditions and cultures, and what difference does it make to me of how your height or your color of your skin? It doesn't make right. a difference to me. <laughs> Why does it make a difference to other people? And, I don't know. you know. I don't know what you look like either. And I don't care. It doesn't matter, right? You are you are in you. It's not the outside. It's the heart. It's the soul. It's the spirits within us. And my mother always taught us that. Always. 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 Never, ever, ever judge no matter what, if they're disrespecting you, walk away. Walk away. You don't have to take it. Just walk away and pray for them. I said, hmm, idea. Okay, we'll do that. Then I had a wonderful partner that was into meditation and his spirituality and little Buddhism. And I learned a lot about that, too. You know, let go. And one thing that my mother did teach me was, as a child, if you close your eyes, nobody can see you. It was a joke to her, but if you really look into that, if you close your eyes, nobody can see you. You're in you. It doesn't matter what they see. It's what you see inside you. And you have to be very confident about yourself. My mother taught us to be good, to share what we can. You see somebody struggling, go help them up. Help them up. Oh, I'm 87 now, and she's starting to get tired. There we are. I can understand. It's not like she, she's not like she's been sitting around doing nothing oh, no. all these 87 years, let alone giving birth to all the children. It's time to get tired, and that's okay. Yeah. But she still has good lessons to teach. Yes, yeah, she does. I know. It must be hard at times. <laughs> uh, the day before yesterday... Five family members we went up to the Salamos because I was sent up in the Salamos. She told me about the food truck up there. We brought enough food down for at least seven families down here. And my mother taught us to do this since she was young. And we did. We called up people and said, okay, come on, we have this, this, this. We had like 240 pounds of pork. We had all kinds of stuff, you know, that they want to get rid of. The food banks, they... they People are giving so much stuff out. But we know people that need it. People that are sick, they can't get out, people that don't have vehicles. Um, I was exhausted. <laughs> oh, but it must made you feel really good. It, it does, it does, but it's mostly about helping. That was the number one lesson. Never, ever hurt help. The circle. If people are depressed and lonely, go help somebody. Go do something for somebody else, not for you. Yeah, Mom taught us that. Your mom, Cordelia, had her hands full. It must have been tough. She was doing the best she could with what she had. Yeah. And she would always say, you always have to guide that sapling. You have to tie it on both sides so it'll go straight. You have to guide it. You have to guide it. Because if you don't guide it, it'll go toward the sun all the time just where it, go, where it sh- shouldn't always go. It should go straight, you know, equally balanced. I like that. She's pretty smart. Well, maybe one day I'll get to meet her. That would be wonderful. Marcy Coronado, thank you so much. Really has been great. You bet. Adios. Adios. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jackie Tantillo, and you've been listening to Should Have Listened to My Mother. If you'd like to contact me, you can always email me at Jackie at should have listened to my mother.com at the write out the whole thing or I'm on Facebook and Instagram. See you next time.